Well, we are in Genesis chapter 25 today, and uh, we didn't really discuss, Minister Joe, um, how we want to progress in terms of reading, but I think I'm going to read this. Is yeah, that okay sure. to you? Genesis chapter 25, we find out a little detail that we've been talking about over these last weeks, but that is still a strange detail. It's, it's one that one day I'll spend a lot of time thinking about. We won't spend a lot of time talking about it, And that's that Abraham gets remarried, even in his advanced old age, after Sarah dies. And we're never given any reason that he does that. Um, we could imagine, I suppose. But the text, I guess, isn't that interested in it. It says, Abraham took another wife, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jakshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and Leumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephor, Hanok, Abidah, and Elda'ah. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living. And he sent them away from his son Isaac, eastward to the east country. This is the length of Abraham's life. 175 years. And Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac settled at Be'er Lahai Roy. These are the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's slave girl, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth, Nebaiot, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kidar, Adbiel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedemah. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their villages and by their encampments, 12 princes according to their tribes. This is the length of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled down alongside of all of his people. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. I see why you didn't want to read those names. <laughs> there was confidence. a lot there. You said confidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny, um, even though I know that pronouncing the names we do know, the way that we know them, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, that's not right mm -hmm. in Hebrew. That's just an Anglicized way of saying it. Um, it probably sounds really weird to hear the other ones pronounced correctly. <laughs> because you're like, are these people from the same country? Yeah. That's just me. I'm pronouncing the others like according to Hebrew pronunciation. And with the ones we're familiar with, I'm keeping the English. So. Yeah, they want to but, confuse us. Yeah, okay. Jacob's name in Hebrew is Yaakov. Yeah. Ya Yaakov. Huh. Yeah, and uh, Isaac is Yitzhak. Yeah, so, but I kept I kept the English ones for them. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. think they would have been thrown off by that for sure. <laughs> you know, I, 
when I planted, I planted a church in Grain Valley, Missouri. Um, I don't know, it's 10 years ago now. And um, I tried in that church, every time I read a name in the Old Testament to do it according to the Hebrew reading. And I quit that in two weeks. Because nobody knew what I was talking about. Yeah. Yonah, who's Yonah? <laughs> <laughs> Yonah. Yaakov? Yeah. Dawid? What? <laughs> like, do we know these people? And then I realized I'm going to stop that. That's pretentious. Right. Yeah. What was Jen saying? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, uh, Jen is a really easygoing person. So she'd only become concerned if I was losing the people. Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, we might as well begin at the beginning here in chapter 25, verse one, and just talk about the second family that Abraham has. Yeah. Do, do you want to say anything about that? Um, we also noticed, now, I made a mistake. We were talking about this before. I'm pretty sure that the Midian here is the, the Midianites. But I yeah. thought the Midianites were from Ishmael, but apparently they're not. They're from Abraham's second wife, Keturah, and that's who Moses married into. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to go back and change it in the previous videos, but apparently I was wrong about that. Uh, I, sure makes you wonder. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that this is the Midian that um, Moses' father-in-law comes from. But that would be not a descendant of Ishmael, but a descendant of Keturah. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Why do you think Abraham married again? I, I, it's outside of the text. We don't want to spend too much time here, but it just seems like it's just hanging there like a really ripe piece of fruit. Well, I, see, I seem to think that you know, my first, first reaction is he's like, here, I'm going to help God again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some, make some more kids. Uh, Sarah's gone, and uh, um, you know, Sarah had her opinion about them being as good as dead. So, uh, um, I, I think this is a proof to, to prove her wrong. <laughs> yeah, you think he was? It was out of spite. I, you know, it's it's difficult for me to to understand why he did, especially since he doesn't give any of his inheritance to these kids. He gives them gifts while he's alive, but he doesn't give them any inheritance just seems like a strange move. I mean, obviously, you know, if there are people who dispute the historicity of mm -hmm. the books of Genesis, but this is one of those passages I always point to as solidifying the historicity of Abraham, because who would make this up? Right. Like, why, why would you want to make this up? Like, it seems like a very strange move. It, it strikes me as anytime something happens and I go, what? I think, well, that must be historical, because otherwise, why would you tell us? Right. Well, in one instance, the text is saying he took another wife, and then later on, he says, "But, but these are the sons of his concubines." Yeah. Which, which I, I, I don't think they're probably, uh, unless unless they're using those words in other in, a, in other ways to, to try to make a distinction between the mother of Isaac and, and the. And the mother of these, of these, of these uh, sons. Yeah, I, I would say that the final word concubine needs to dominate it because in chapter 25, verse one says Abraham took another wife. The Hebrew just says he took another woman. It's just the word Isha, which means woman. Ish is man, Isha is woman. And so they're translating it as wife because he's marrying her. Uh, but it, you know, it can mean wife depending on the context, but it also can just mean woman. But given the context, and verse six clearly uses the word for concubine. Mm -hmm. I think probably a better translation would have been Abraham took a concubine. Yeah. Um, and because it's a concubine, it's unclear when. Did he do this while Sarah was alive? The way the story is flowing, it sounds like after she died. Mm -hmm. But concubines typically weren't, well, maybe they were taken after the death of a wife. Seems strange to me, though. Everywhere else in the Bible, you take a concubine while your wife's living. So yeah, unless they came along with her, right? With yeah, we Keturah. don't know who Keturah was. Right. There's nothing about her uh, other than this. It's, it's well, she certainly certainly was fertile. She had that many sons. I mean, we're yeah, talking. There's certainly talking, no question either about Abraham's fertility. Yeah, well, five five sons. I you know, at least think it. I mean, even if she had him effectively, that's five years of, uh, yeah. of sons. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, interesting. And I wonder if some of these were born while Sarah was still living. 
Could be. I'm, I'm not sure the text is super clear on that, but in, traditionally, this is after the death of Sarah, because in the narrative, we're not told about this wife till after Sarah's death, so it makes sense that it would follow, but she, is, she seems clearly a concubine and not a wife, um, which makes sense, because um, the kids don't inherit, and the children right. of concubines don't inherit. If, it, if she had been a full wife, it would have been a breach of all protocol for Abraham to give nothing to them, to give everything to Isaac. As far as I can tell, the, imp the implication of giving everything to Isaac is that none of the rest of these were considered full children of Abraham. So yeah, I think, I think that's what's so, so important here because it's like, uh, um, I, it seems, it seems as though that the emphasis really is verse five that, yeah. that, because that in theologically we we would we would think that that Isaac is supposed to be the one to carry on the call yeah. of, of Abraham. So so if he says to give everything to him, it seems seems like that that's the distinction that, that that even this this whole paragraph or this this amount of information is talking about to make that distinction between the, the children of you know. Yeah, but you'd it, almost think like this was preserved because um, at the time of the writing, uh, Moses or the editors later, um, that there was some dispute maybe over inheritance rights from some of the, the, the descendants of these folks. And they were trying to solidify the fact that they were children of a concubine and that Isaac inherited everything. It almost feels polemical like that. But um, I, none of these... Um, people groups really show up in the biblical narrative as ever competing for Israel's inheritance. So it's it's just interesting. Even the Midianites, they, they cause problems for Israel at times, and sometimes they're a help to Israel. But um, there doesn't seem to be a dispute over Midianites thinking that they had a right to the land of Canaan because of their descendancy from Abraham. Like, you don't see that anywhere in the scriptures. So it's it's still hard to imagine why this would be included, other than it's a historical detail that they wanted to preserve. I think I've heard before too that the verse six where it says, but this he gave the sons of, of the concubines, he get, Abraham gave them gifts while he was still living, and he sent them sent them away from his son Isaac eastward through the country. I've heard I've heard before somebody saying that that was Abraham's way of trying to protect Isaac. Yeah. And it, we um, could you know the another reason it might be here is because Abraham was to have children as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. So it may show that Abraham, to trace the lineage of Abraham, not only are you tracing the lineage of Isaac, but also Ishmael, and then also all these other children. So it's kind of showing that Abraham is much more fruitful than simply the Jewish people. And that might have been important to Moses. And since they're sent east, we know what's east of Israel. That's where Abraham came from. He sent them back to Mesopotamia and, and to that region. So, or maybe east of the Jordan River could be if they were near you know nearer but in any case he's sending them to populate areas in that direction so we may have a sense that the writer of genesis who i take to be moses originally um even though i'm fully accepting of editors working on the text after that uh prophetic editors um there might be a sense here that it would be impossible to count the descendants of abraham because look at how many there were and he sent them away so who knows how many of these other people groups are related to Abraham through this? Yeah, and I, and I think it points points to it the, the idea in the New Testament of those who who have the faith of Abraham are those who those who want who follow the call of God yeah. to, to be be a blessing to the nation. Right. You know, so I think I think that that also is reflected here too that. that there is that capacity even if they're not born of Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. And my guess, this is just a guess, but I, because this is a concubine, I suspect he took Keturah while Sarah was still alive. But um, maybe the narrative flows better to assume that didn't happen. But the word concubine has me hung up there. But it's clearly not a full wife. The kids did not inherit. And in verse six, they're called concubines and it's plural. So it seems to me we're talking about Hagar and Keturah. Right. So that it's, that would be my guess. With the same the same thought as it was with with, hey, with Hagar, um, that idea of, of of trying to, I mean, it, there is that that thought of 
of trying to trying to fulfill the promise of God on our own, our our own means and, and ways. Yeah. Yeah, it gives me a sense that maybe the Hagar story is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. That there was also another wife and other children. Um, and you know, maybe it's more simplistic to think of all these as coming after the birth of Isaac, but the way Hebrew people arrange their narratives, it could just as easily have been during or before. Mm -hmm. So well, I, just, I would, I would assume that Sarah was sick for a period of time that she didn't just up and die one day. And right, right. So it, it, we only God knows the true history here, but I think we fleshed out uh, a bit of it. Abraham lives a long time, so he was seventy years old when he left Haran, and he's lived almost a hundred years. Yep. And uh, I don't think that was expected. Now, some, some would say that this is how long people lived, and that diminishes the miracle done when Isaac was born at Abraham's advanced age. But it seems that Sarah and Abraham didn't expect to have children in their 90s. And if they didn't expect to have children in their 90s, they probably didn't expect to live to 175 years old. I think the book of Genesis presents this as a blessing. And you'll notice that um, Ishmael doesn't live that long, though he does live a long time. He doesn't live that long. Yeah, I think it was like 137 years or something like that. Right. Yeah. One thing that's important is that um, Isaac is for the most part raised in what is called um, the Negev. So that's the, the part of this story that is, um, that is at least consistent. They're always in the same same area. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going to pull up the, the map again so we can see where he is. So again, this is our map of Israel. This is the Negev, this area in south. It's going to end up being the, in the tribe of Judah. And this is Beersheba, uh, which is a significant one. And somewhere I don't know where Bear Lahai Roy is. Um, you notice it's not listed on this map, but we know it's not far from where they were uh, in the Negev. That would be my guess. So it's probably somewhere around there. But I think what the text is telling us is that Isaac doesn't travel the way Abraham did. You know, Abraham is up at Hebron. He's sometimes near Salem. He's sometimes up at Bethel. But Isaac is going to stay down here. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, that is where Hagar names that well, right? When she's thrown out, Bear Lahai Roy. Mm -hmm. But Ishmael doesn't end up being raised around there. It's, it's Isaac who stays around that area. So geographically, that's where we are. It's all in the tribe of Judah. And that's probably important for the future history of the people of Israel because the tribe of Judah is a significant area and it's the last part of Israel to fall. Mm -hmm. And it's the primary location of Isaac and Abraham. Hebron's in the tribe of Judah as well. And Abraham spends some significant time there. So the, the, where they bury, the, well, Ishmael and Isaac are just jumping a little forward here after, after Abraham dies. Yeah. Uh, buries them in the same cave. Yeah. With Sarah. Yeah. At Machpelah. So that was up, I'll, you know, I got to remember where that was. Um, I can't well, remember the field, off the top of my head. The field by the cave, you know? Yeah, I'm just trying to remember, was that in Hebron or was that in uh, Bethel? But anyway, it's in the hill country. Yeah, all I know is that they were bought from a Hittite. From the Hittites. I know it was up in the hill country. I just can't remember. We'll have to, our people can go back to that lesson. They'll figure out where that was. But, um, but yes, he, he gets buried in the same cave and it's the one that he bought probably for the same reasons that he negotiated that cave. Um, he wants to live on land that's under the territory of Yahweh and not under okay. the control of the false gods of the land. Yeah, it's interesting though. Uh, verse 9 says his, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave. Doesn't yeah. say anything about those other guys. Doesn't say anything, and that that could lead to the conclusion that they weren't born yet, um, yeah, or that they weren't old enough. Yet. Not, of course, they were born, but they weren't old enough yet. Maybe, maybe they were still young. 
but it also could be that he routinely sent them east and so they weren't here mm. you know ishmael and isaac stay around it might be a sense of uh, a greater closeness mm -hmm. so that's it is interesting but they bury him together so at least we can say isaac and ishmael knew each other right you know that they weren't completely estranged yeah i don't know where these other kids are though where was Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua when Abraham died? I don't know. But they didn't come to the funeral. And how many times have we heard that? Where there are certain kids don't come to the funeral. When that happens in our day, there's something going on. Maybe there was something going on then. Yes. Then we get the list of Ishmael's children, and he is quite productive. I mean, how many kids did you see? One Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Right? Thirteen, is that right? No, it's a twelve. Twelve. Oh, 13. you're right. I, I counted Ishbiel's name. Yeah, twelve. So he has as many sons as Jacob will eventually have. Yeah. So he's he's productive. Twelve princes, according to their tribes. And he has a good life. Yeah. God fulfilled his promise. Probably the reason that needs to be there is to remind us that God promised that Ishmael would be cared for and he would be blessed, and he was. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't say much about his character, though. We don't know anything about him. <laughs> I mean, we, well, he, we were told God prophesied that he would be at odds with his brothers. But, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't hear a great deal about him. Sure seems like he's pretty civil, though, with Isaac. Been burying yeah at least they agreed father. that they both loved abraham yeah yep. neither one of them should have at, at after the, after some of the experiences that they had i know i know pretty tragic it is tragic ishmael put out of his house and isaac almost sacrificed i don't think abraham was winning father of the year no <laughs> not on that one not, not, on, not on the face of time magazine for sure and the rest of his kids didn't even come for the funeral uh, not even Newsweek. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, uh, so if we get to verse 19, this is really the heart of the passage. Um, when we get a story of Isaac um, having children, and I, Rebecca, did you do this? This math. So Isaac is 60 years old when Jacob and Esau are born. And he was 37, I think we said when he married Rebecca. So they're married like 20 some odd years, 23 years before they have children. And that's an interesting number because I think that's how long Abraham and Sarah were in the land before Isaac was born. Sounds cool. It's, it's, it's in the ballpark of that, if not exactly that. Yeah. So, so the numbers are interesting. And of course, here we have a theme developing. Sarah was barren. And now so is Rebecca. Mm -hmm. So we've got two patriarchs, both barren. What? I, I can't say, I mean, we know why it's here in the story. But what do you think about that? Well, I think it, I think it reveals the desperation of, uh, and, and the, drive, the drive for a need to um, God for the promise. And so, so, uh, you, are you saying that God made them barren? Well, it, uh, it seems like that in, in, in some ways, and, and in other ways, it's pretty hard to verify. I mean, uh, it, it seems that way because, because of, of the response from, from, uh, from Isaac. It says in verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted her granted granted his prayer. It sounds it sounds as though that from that perspective that they're actually trying to lead you to believe that that they're that that it that indeed whether it be Rebecca or Sarah or Sarai if you want to, you want to say it that way that they were barren for a reason to drive the men to God. Yeah. But yet we know in our modern world that. Infertility is a little bit more complicated than. Yeah, that. yeah, we know, of course, that it can be either the man or the woman, or just the way their genetics 
and bodies are working together that can cause barrenness. And sometimes it's completely inexplicable. Now with Sarah and Abraham, we found out it wasn't Abraham because he has many other children. Um, but with Isaac and Rebecca, we don't really know uh, where the problem was. But I wonder, and this is just a speculative thing to say, I wonder if God chose a family that had fertility issues because Sarah is Abraham's half sister. So she's from the same family as Rebecca. And you have two women in close proximity, both barren. Um, it makes me wonder if there's something genetic going on. And it wouldn't surprise me at all that God would choose a family line that had difficulty reproducing. It seems like he loves the underdog, that he loves those who normal society would consider to be cursed because barrenness was a curse in the ancient world um, and a shame. And he seems to have chosen a family that has multiple members that carry this. It, it, it could be part of his election. You know, now, of course, he could have afflicted them with barrenness. I'm not disagreeing with you exactly. None of us know in order to deliver them from it later. But he also, I'm just su suggesting he could have chosen a family that this was part of their genetic makeup. Barrenness is a recurrent theme throughout the scriptures when it comes to the people of Israel. Yeah, I mean, it, all, it also reflects, like, as, as, again, about the, the fact that of, of relying on God for, for the promise. I mean, uh, uh, Abraham taking another wife is, is a kind of a contrast in some ways. And we also see a re reoccurring, similar similarities reoccurring, like it was described with, with Rebecca and Sarah. Yeah. But but the again the, the desire to try try to do this on your own is not something that Isaac did yeah. here. Uh so that doesn't follow on the same. So that maybe that maybe there's an accentuation here of, of maybe there's a there's a chance that maybe we're learning something. <laughs> not, and not and you story. and I talked, we are not going to get there today, but you and I talked in the story of Abraham about how Sarah's barrenness was in some ways convenient because of the way Abraham kept lying about her being his sister and get, getting taken into other people's houses. We are going to find out that Isaac does the same thing. Mm. And so is the barrenness related to that. It's interesting. But this barrenness will become a theme. So you've got Sarah and then Rebecca, both who struggle with barrenness for a long time. Sarah for her whole life. Rebecca through most of her childbearing years, I mean, and, and only for a miracle to save her. Same will be true with Rachel. Rachel will be unable to have children for a long time uh, with Jacob, and then only able to have two, ultimately. And okay. um, when we get into the book of First Samuel, we'll discover that Hannah, Samuel's mother, is also barren right. and struggles with the barrenness. Um, so, we, I mean... The, I don't think it ends there, but those are the most prominent early examples of barrenness. Um, but it leads into the New Testament where John the Baptist's mother was barren. And then God gives her a, a son. And of course, Mary wasn't barren, but she also was a virgin and unmarried. And God gives her a child without the need of a man. So this idea of, of this procreation is, a, is an interesting theme and the difficulty of it. And that, of course, connects, at least in Genesis, to the curse that with great difficulty would children be brought forth. And it seems like God picked a family that would have great difficulty right. bringing forth the next generation without his help. I'm just right. saying maybe deliberate. Yeah. It, it, I mean, like I said, it's it driving, driving, uh, driving people to God. I think, I think that's the thing is there's, there's a, I mean, it could be sim simply from our, from our perspective, simply just their age. It waited so long to have kids uh, that that it made it even harder to, to conceive the fragility of the yeah. of, of how of how things had to work there. And so, well, in fairness, there is no birth control, so I imagine they were trying to have kids for twenty three years. Yeah, you know, yeah. but they couldn't. Right. Yeah. So it is interesting um, that theme, and it's important that we just recognize it is a theme in the line of Abraham, infertility. And it's an ironic theme because by the time of the New Testament, a great many of Abraham's physical descendants reject Jesus and will be a, they'll be compared to illegitimate children. And I just read today in Isaiah, I was reading Isaiah 24 to 28, and one of those 
passages when the Israelites are repenting of what they did. They said that they were pregnant, but they gave birth to wind. Mm. Um, and they could not produce any heirs that would carry on God's teachings. And that's interesting because, of course, that's picking up on the theme of barrenness. Mm. So it's, it's, um, it's a theme we should, I, I, we probably spent enough time on it, but at this early stage of the scriptures, we should realize that it's becoming a prominent theme. Yeah, and it's not just, just necessarily the physical, physicalness of being yeah. pregnant with a baby, it's actual spiritual, spiritual. Not to compare that they did something wrong as much as a, 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 a foreshadowing of what, what it can be to, to be actually a, a person with a, without, without real faith in God. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Everything is spiritual and physical at the same time. That's mm. what you're saying. So it's not simply a physical reality. It also has a spiritual component. It's not morally condemned. Like there's no sense in this text that Rebecca couldn't have children because she was, a, she was morally bankrupt or she was doing something sinful. Um, but still, there's a shame that came in that culture with not being able to bear children. And it's the first command God gave the people of the earth, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Of the 613 commandments of the Torah, it's the first one. And Abraham's family has great difficulty fulfilling the first command. <laughs> you know, they, they can't multiply without God's help. And there's a lesson in that. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Isaac remedies the situation by praying to the Lord. And of mm. course, you ask yourself, did you ask yourself this when you read it? Why didn't he pray before? Or maybe he did pray and this is the one that worked. How did you read it? I, I think I think it's a more more of a reactionary. I mean, my wife gets sick enough with headaches and I and I, and I pray over her and I, I I ask Lord, you know, and it's like it would be nice to to pray say lord let her ever have headaches again yeah but in some ways it drives me to prayer so i mean there's some some similarities here um, um where where it's where are you know and again i think there's this theme of desperation in the text too where where it's like how can i be somebody if i I don't have any anybody that's going to carry on the the, the this, this promise this yeah. this truth. Yeah, I think there's some of that. I think there's some of Isaac and all of us, right? Where when we when we're young and and vigorous, we don't think to pray. We figure it'll just work out, like we can handle it on our own. But then when when age starts to catch up, and you realize that some of the things you hope to do, there's not a lot of time to do them, and you start to feel the desperateness of that clock ticking. Mm. Well, now we'll go to God. <laughs> you yeah. know because now if he doesn't do something we're in a lot of trouble and i agree with you i think there's a sense here because you get a sense in the text that this has been such a long time you almost get the sense that the prayer is out of desperation and and i wonder being younger if he ever did pray it yeah but you know this isn't true of all of us sometimes we don't turn to god until we think we're running out of time well it's definitely captured here and, and we know we know from past experiences that we've read so far and talked about, that those those who make desperate decisions a lot of times often find themselves in a, in a messy quagmire. Right. And of course, Rebecca gets more than she bargained for because the Lord answers the prayer and then it, it sounds like it's a tough pregnancy. Yeah. So the way right. they did the way they describe it is that the two children are struggling within her. Now, first she doesn't know she has twins. And of course there are no ultrasounds in these days. So, um, I'm, I'm sure there were ways, but this she's first time mother. She's older, um, and uh, it's a rough pregnancy. Yeah, I mean it's it's got to be really rough, right? Because in verse 20, 22, she says, "If it's to be this way, then why do I live?" Yeah, right. Right. Or am I going to live through this? Yeah, I, I have not looked at the Hebrew to see. Obviously, that word is added. Um. I should look at this at some point because it, it might be it might be more like if it is to be this way then why so they might be adding a little bit yeah it says the meaning of the hebrew is uncertain 
So they're guessing that she's, she's wondering why she's alive. Um, but that's a bit of a guess. Um, mm. It'd be, be hard to imagine for me that she wished to die. It was such a bad pregnancy, but maybe one of our female listeners mm. who've had children could tell us if there are pregnancies that are so bad, you wish you were dead. I, I suspect that might be a misinterpretation, but. Well, I do, I do know that, that sometimes if you're in the birthing room, that, that many a husband's been punched or slapped or. Uh, yeah, crap. yeah, certainly <laughs> birth itself. <laughs> yeah, well, like we know, birth is no joke. Um, yeah. But um, this is before she goes into labor, right? This is just part of carrying the children and it's apparently very, very hard for her. And I know, you know, with morning sickness and other things, some people have terrible pregnancies and maybe it's not an over-exaggeration to say she wished she was dead. Um, our female listeners would have to tell us. Yeah, um, that we'd probably get criticized for that just a yeah, little well, bit. Well, rightly so. You and I don't know what we're talking about in that respect. I mean, I, but, I listened to my wife's experience, but I didn't live it. Right. So, but anyway, the interpreters here think she's, she's wondering why she's even alive to endure this. And so she goes to God and prays and the Lord answers her prayer mm -hmm. with a riddle. And this is very typical with the way God talks with people who aren't prophets, riddles and dreams. And the, in the book of, in the, later in the law, Moses <clears throat> will reveal to the people that this is how God speaks to all of his, his prophets, except for special ones like Moses and, you know, a few of the others that he's going to do riddles and dreams. And this is a riddle. It's a prophecy, but it's also a riddle. What does it mean? And if you think it's clear, you have not read the rest of the story because Isaac and Rebecca are not on the same page as to how to interpret this. So two nations are in your womb. Two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. So there's a bunch of riddles here. First, they're twins. So who's the elder? Right. That's uh, going to come up, right? Mm -hmm. Is the one who comes out of the womb first older? Or is it the one that was conceived first? And who knows who's conceived? Yeah, first? that's a tricky one. It's all difficulty. What does it mean that they'll be divided? Like Isaac and Ishmael were divided? Or will it be a different kind of division? And the elder will serve the younger, but one will be stronger than the other. Which one's the stronger one? The older or the younger? You might assume that the one who rules would be the stronger, which I think is how Isaac interpreted it. But... It's not how Rebecca understood it. Right. So this is a riddle. The answer to her prayer is a riddle. And it, it right. comes out to be literally true, but in advance, it's impossible to tell um, yeah. what this means. And what seems clear to me for a long time in my life, I thought Rebecca never told Isaac this riddle. Because the way that they fought over who was going to rule seemed to me that one of them had information the other didn't have. But the longer I studied the Hebrew here, I think they both interpreted it differently. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely took sides. And, you know, I mean, if you're talking about physical size, physical size or physical abilities, it sounds like Esau, you know, was like, you know, it was like Don compared to, uh, you know, toothpick man. And yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But, and, but, but Esau size. comes out holding onto his ankle. You know, I, I can imagine doctors reading that going, no way, that's mythological. That would never yeah. happen. And I, I think I agree um, that that is a very unlikely scenario, but we're dealing now with, um, you know, God's history where very unusual things end up happening. <laughs> but well, I wonder, have you ever heard a story of where one twin comes out somehow attached to the other? Well, that was the weird one about uh, was it Tamar or, or uh, further on in the in the first testament where he talked about a cord. They put a cord around it because it stuck its hand out. Yeah, I know. But this seems like some Hollywood thing. It doesn't seem. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that would be the way that it would go, um, but you know, a lot of births, every how many births every minute here in the world today. Um, 
I, I'm guessing lots of strange things happen. And there's, remember the, the way the Bible presents the line of Abraham is that there's a lot of spiritual stuff involved as well. You remember the sons of God marrying the daughters of man and before the flood, the, the presence of these Nephilim. Um, there's clearly some spiritual resistance to God's choosing these people. Mm -hmm. And so you might expect some very unusual behaviors uh, going all the way through. So I'm willing to take these things at face value and say, this must have been the way that they saw it. That this must have been the way they experienced it. But um, yeah, anyway. Well, there are some peculiar stuff too about it. Like the way he saw it was, uh, was very hairy and, and, and red. I mean, I mean, some of that could have been blood, I think. I don't know uh, how, how that works, but, but uh, this or led, whether or not. This led to a theory in the 1800s that the Celtic people were from Esau. Um, you know, so, you know, races are hard to talk about mm -hmm. because they're very recent. Um, we can't trace genetics back far enough to deal with the patriarchs. So we really don't know how diverse things were in these days or how many of what you what eventually became european people were bound up in the middle east in these days and what eventually became you know those who were in china and asia and those who were in africa we don't know how closely all these groups were bound up um in the middle eastern area so you know our we're very very um ethnically you know separated today like obviously you and I come from a race with very little melanin in our skin and some very pronounced adaptations to the cold um, and people in other races have different adaptations. But we don't know in the days of Abraham if things were quite that, if they had gotten that far yet. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult to say. It might be that um, the people of Israel were much more genetically diverse than people are today. It may very well be. We don't. We just don't know. But it does sound. The text sounds like Esau had red hair. Yeah, and that's not a typical Middle Eastern trait. Um, right. At least not this way. And later, um, David. The same word is used of David when it's, he said he's ruddy and handsome. That ruddy is still the word for red, and it sounds like he might have been redheaded, which is again unusual for this region. But it's a strange region because the Philistines have uh, European DNA. They found some Philistine burial sites nowadays and they've tested the DNA and they have European DNA uh, along with Middle Eastern DNA as well. So it's, it, you know, we might be thinking in our terms where the races are very ethnically distinct or at least um, by physical appearance it might not have been so much in these days. You know, there might've been much greater ethnic diversity in the Middle East than we think. And remember, yeah. Abraham's children, you know, think about Jacob's children. They not, I mean, he's, he's married uh, Rachel and Leah, and then they have servants who give birth to some of his kids, and we don't even know where they were from. Right. So those 12 sons of Jacob might have been, might have looked physically very different because they have different parents. There are four women giving birth to these children, and two of them, we don't know where they're from. Right. So, so anyway, he does seem to have red hair. And that led to some weird theories. You can, you can go down the Google rabbit hole if you want to see how many people in Europe tried to, to trace their own descendancy to the lost tribes of Israel and uh, how they did it. Um, there's stuff in England. There's, you can find some, some pastors and preachers who had theories. And, you know, these are some of the details they take. So anyway, but it does sound like he had red hair. and Maybe it's a euphemism. But I don't think it meant he was bloodier than Jacob. I would disagree with you on that. Well, I just think, you know, first <laughs> first through the womb, that might might have been more. more well, I'm the, sure, I'm sure, I think both would be equally messy. Yeah. I don't know. But I will say this. My father is an identical twin. And and the, these guys are not. Obviously, they're fraternal twins. But they're, they're, you, there's such a difference even though with identical twins, it's the same genetics, um, such a difference in personality and even in appearance. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and these two guys could not have been more different. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the classic, again, like what you said before. And I think, I think uh, 
someone else in another meeting mentioned about how, how he saw in, in Jacob or a classic example of Cain and Abel uh, as well, because you, you see the same kind of appetites in, in, the, in the attitudes, but yet there are some differences, obvious differences between yeah. Jacob. I mean, I can't believe I'm still pushing that genetic diversity that must have been present in the Middle East at this time, because, you know, Esau's covered in hair, and Jacob is like very not hairy. Like, you don't, you might notice some diversity, but this seems extreme. Like my brother and I, you know, you wouldn't be confused that we were of the same family. Like, like, he is a little bit more the Mediterranean from our French background than I do. I'm a little more the Scandinavian, but still we both can grow a beard. We both have the same color hair, you know, it, but these two guys are like opposites. Right. And they, yeah. yeah. And they're twins. You know, they're coming from, I think we've got a lot of genetic diversity going on at this time of human history, maybe much more than is appreciated today. But yeah. Well, the, I mean, even, even the name, in the the even further on where he talks about the birthright and the stew mm. i'll i'll have those kind of have have that have something to do with with that color with red yeah and he gets the nickname edom which means red mm -hmm. and that becomes the edomites yeah and then king herod is one of esau's descendants king herod the great uh who has the confrontation with jesus he's an edomian yeah. which is an edomite you know, but yeah, Red is his whole tri his whole tribe gets named after Red. Mm, yeah. You think yeah, that they, means they were all redheads? We don't know. Edom doesn't exist in the Middle East anymore. Yeah. So well, it would be impossible I, to say. To me it's less less about the actual color of the hair as much as the, the connotation of the appetite. The what is it, stew or, yep, or the red stew. Or or the oh you know, he as we learn, we learn later on about, about Esau despising his parents. Uh, and marries marries a, a woman that they, that they hate. Yeah, from the Canaanites. Yeah, so there's that sense of appetite. And I think it even we alluded here just a moment ago about about Herod the Great. His appetite was so so in, incredible for for self perseverance and 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 his own his own ideas similar similar to, to what Esau does. Yeah. Yeah, he is definitely an impulsive man who who doesn't think things through. That's who he tr proves to be. But what's even more throwing is when he meets up with Jacob Blake. It's like totally uh, takes that whole wind out of that, out of that sail. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that when we get there. But yeah, it's it's funny how when you're young and all you have is your father's wealth, you're constantly fighting over who's going to get it. That's what they do. But eventually Esau becomes rich in his own right, and he's no longer concerned. Right, right. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, I got plenty. You know, but as a kid, you just don't know that's going to happen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so this riddle seems straightforward enough to me. I, I would read it the way Re Rebecca did. Right, the one will be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. I don't know which one's going to be stronger, but I, I would take the last phrase as more determinative. The elder will serve the younger, and who came out first? Esau. So he's going to serve Jacob. But maybe they wondered, what does serve mean? Like clearly, Isaac does not associate that with who gets the birthright, and he doesn't associate it with who gets the blessing. So. It's, it's just an interesting story. And, you, and as we get into it, you could read Isaac as trying to change God's command to Rebecca, or you could read it as though Rebecca didn't tell him and he's operating in the dark. I think he interpreted it differently. That's my instinct. But this is a riddle and it's going to direct the course of this family's life. Right. Right, and it's it seems it seems like some of it's really easy to, to plug in character, to say the two nations, you know, obviously you have Israel and and in Edom. I mean, that's the ultimate thing. You know, it's really easy to try to try to plug it in as formula. Mm. You know? but if you if you take your eyes off off the, the actual people and their appetites, that's a different different 
do. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? And that Isaac, so the two boys are very different. Esau is a hunter and he's a wild, he lives in the wilds, right? I mean, he's, that's the way he's presented. Whereas Jacob is more settled. He stays among the tents. He's a shepherd, you know, which is what Abraham was. You know, it's what Abel was. But for some reason, that's not that appealing to Isaac. He likes the hunter. And, and hunters are not presented great in Genesis, right? You have the Nephilim, who are these great warriors. You have Nimrod, who's a mighty hunter before the Lord, who settles all of these terrible pagan cities and seems to be a hangover from the Nephilim. Um, so hunters are not exactly presented well. And yet Isaac loves the hunter. And it says he loves it because he was fond of wild caught food. Do you think that goes back to Moriah? Remember the ram that took his place was a wild yeah. one. That could it, be. It wasn't livestock. Right. Yeah, there could be there could be that he finds comfort comfort in that. Or, or I think uh, it has I think it relates somehow to, to Moriah. I think there's something about the tents of Abraham that's less appealing to Isaac. And and something about Jacob that just doesn't resonate with him. Even though Jacob is more like Abraham. Abraham was a was in the tents. He was a he was a shepherd. Yeah. Well, I, Isaac might be like a lot of a lot of men who who react to their to the way their father father fathered them. Then in the end find find out that they, they're gonna do it exactly what their father did anyways. Yeah, because I've I've have you heard this? Some people present Jacob as a mama's boy. Mm. What they used to call they used to say when I was a kid. You know, somebody who was a little less adventurous, a little less willing to take risks, who preferred to stay home, who let his mother fight his battles for him or whatever, or his father. Um, he, but that's not really what the text says here. The difference here is that Jacob is perfectly content to carry on the family business. He's a shepherd. He stays among the tents. But Esau is, is more like Ishmael, right? He's going out into the wilds. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, almost, it's not exactly a manly man versus a mama's boy. It's more like a dutiful, hardworking son versus an adventurer. Or a wanderer. Yeah. Or a wanderer, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, Isaac, arguably, is more like Jacob than Esau. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Isaac so, doesn't do anything of note. Maybe that's why he likes Esau. Maybe Esau has characteristics that he envies. Right. Or or aspires or lived vicariously through. Right. Right. Tried to, you know, uh, often that's a, that's a case with, with parents too. They, they, you know, my kid's a great soccer player, you know. Well, and you'll notice that parents who have the most conflict with their kids, the kids they have the most conflict with, they see much of themselves in. And sometimes they have less conflict with kids they see as very different than themselves, especially if those differences are characteristics they might envy. So there might be more to this. And I just want to push away from the idea that Jacob is presented here as a bit of a wimp because mm. he's not, and which is clear in the rest of the story, right? Jacob is crafty. He's smart. He's hardworking. He's devoted. I mean, there's nothing about Jacob that makes him lazy or, fearful or afraid like there's none of that in jacob he even wrestles god and doesn't give up i mean he's he's going to be an intense character and i don't think that it's presenting him as as any he it's just there's a difference between these two guys esau likes to go out and hunt game jacob probably eats what he raises different yeah well there's a sense of disability there too where there's a lot more risk uh, with those who who want an adventure and and, the, and also, I mean, if you're talking spiritually, those those who who seem to be uh, more reckless at times often find themselves in more dire straits. Yeah, and Jacob is going to prove to be deceitful as well, and so he's not all good. I'm not trying to present him as a a character pure as a driven snow, but I do think he gets a bad rap in terms of courageousness and all that. I, I, most of the movies I've seen present him as a, 
a somewhat weak character before God gets his hands on him. But I don't think the text is saying that. That might have been true, but I don't think that's what's implied here. They're just very different from each other. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were just if you're just looking at this without the prophecy, and you were trying to decide which of these two kids would be the better one to take over the family business, I think you would choose Jacob. But Isaac doesn't see that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you you wonder at times if, if Isaac Isaac thought that it was more of a traditional type of thing. Maybe he felt felt like he had he had to he had to endorse Esau because he was the first. Right. Yeah. And then it, it gets you back to that prophecy. It's very interesting. Now, one of the things we said we might get into today is the fact that God is selecting one of these kids for the blessing, contrary to tradition. And before either of them have done anything to distinguish themselves. And that is a theme that will run through the rest of scripture. In the book of Malachi, um, God says, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated, right? I'm just quoting that without the context, but you know the verse. Yep. And that gets picked up again in Romans chapter nine, when Paul is trying to explain that simply being an ethnic child of Abraham doesn't have value. You have to be a child of the promise as Isaac was and as Jacob was. And then he insists that God chooses based on criteria that has nothing to do with human will or effort because he chose Jacob before he was born. Now, I don't know if we want to get, I mean, that's going to be a theme that runs throughout the story of Jacob and Esau, but it's introduced here. What do you think about God prophesying in advance? How do you read this? Like, I'll give you a couple options. Some Arminians in our tradition would say that God looked into the future and saw which one of them was going to lead and therefore prophesied what was going to happen, right? So he saw who they were going to be, and then he simply told in advance Rebecca what was going to be. That is not, I don't think, the way Paul reads it, because Paul seems to insist the election itself dictates Jacob's future. He does not seem to indicate that the, the, the prediction was based on the future that occurred, but rather that the prediction directed the future. I think that's how Paul, but that's hard for Arminians to accept. And we have to wrestle around with what that means. And then how does that figure into our election? Mm -hmm. Why does God hate, why does God despise Jacob? I mean, Esau and choose Jacob. Th this is a question that resonates through all of scripture. Yeah, it, it, that's a tough one because it, you know, it, it's a, a favoritism and, and, uh, the, the foreknowledge or, or the, the, the ability to look into the future is something of our, our scope and, and abilities. But, uh, you know, the, the, I think it's, it's the harder thing that people deal with is that, that God would God would make that decision. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, hard, a hard thing. And, and the, the, I guess the real question is, is do we, do we believe that God, that God, I mean, even, even, I mean, if you want to compare it to like, like decisions in, uh, with, uh, with um, Judas in, in the New Testament, uh, and, and that, that type of calling is, is, a, is, a, is a struggle that I think people, people wrestle with. Yeah. Like, well, you know, now, I've, I've preached on it in a number of different occasions, um, as you know. Um, but I also did a video, so I'm going to find this here. It's what I'm looking for. Sorry. All right. So uh, some of, some people are aware of this because this uh, this would give you more than what we're getting into now. My YouTube channel is under J Thomas Johnson. You can see here it's just under my name. It has my picture. Um, this video is in the Personal Reflections uh, playlist on my YouTube channel. And it's a discussion of Romans 9 to 11, where I lay out more extensively um, this issue of election and what the issue with Jacob and Esau is. So I encourage anybody to go and look at that if you want more than what we're gonna do here. But maybe in this context, Minister Joe, we can just um, respond however briefly 
to the reality that God sometimes does play favorites. Meaning that when there are three people, sometimes God chooses only one of them. This is a theme in Genesis to this point. Because Cain and Abel are in a similar situation to Jacob and Esau, right? Cain and Abel are not given the law. We have no idea what a good sacrifice would be. Neither do they, at least narratively. They both spontaneously try to give God something that would please him. God accepts Abel and not Cain. And that infuriates Cain. The very same thing happens with Jacob and Esau. Before these kids are born, God chooses one of them and not the other. And that's going to lead to continual conflict. And Esau is going to be enraged. In fact, he's going to plot to kill his brother, just as Cain did. And the reason that this conflict has occurred is because God favored one of them. Now, with Cain and Abel, when we talked about it, we kind of said maybe there was something in Cain's heart that distinguished him from Abel. And God said to Cain, sin is crouching at your tent flap. It wants to have you, but you must master it. So we're, it was easy to blame Cain in that case. But here it's a little harder because these kids haven't done anything. Esau was yeah. rejected before he was born. Mm-hmm. How do you respond to that, that situation? How do you make sense of it in your own life that, that sometimes God does show favoritism, at least in the short term? Yeah, I, it, it is painful. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's kind of one of those, one of those balls I'm not really wanting, wanting to hit too hard. Uh, but but realize realize that it does seem seem as though that that there are there are some who who have more more of the blessing of God or the easier start, um, and and yet I do believe that that we do see a, a series of choices that are made later on as well that that reflect that 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 people ha- have to make choices that are, that are either going to turn away from God or turn Turn, turn toward him. Um, and you could right, rightly say, why you know why why did God allow or tell Abraham to sacrifice on Isaac? The only the only option, only heir. It seems it seems cruel and unusual. Um, so so to pick a pick a child would be would be very difficult. I know I uh, have three children. To pick one child over 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 another and say that this was this was going to be successful or or the or the better, I ha- I have to bring it to a to a personal the personal feeling of of knowing that that there are, that that there's a reality of one one for even more successful than the other, yeah. based on their personalities. But I'm not really answering the question other than to say that that I, that I feel that my my uh, the fact that I am a father uh, does have heavily influence how. how how I understand or feel like God must feel with with His children. How do you choose? But how do you, how do you um, allow allow people to make to make the mistake that they do without, yeah. without giving them the freedom to do that? So I, I, I don't, when it, when it comes to determinism, I think we thought pl- had plenty of opportunity to, to make decisions, but they would still be two nations. That's too pretty obvious yeah. to me. And they still still would be uh, there is a good chance that they would be divided. Uh, these are all the traits that are in that in that prophecy there, right? Or, or that, that, that uh, word that was given. And and there and there there is this uh, idea that 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 their service would be there. So I'm not really answering the question other than to say that I think there is some some obvious choice in there. It does seem like like God chooses. It, just as much as he chose Abraham from his brother or right. his father, or there's a distinction there in a continuity that that I would probably have to say has to happen in, in order for the the actual call of Abraham to be yeah has to be carried on in some way yeah or, well or interact it, and I welcome you to interact with me, Minister Joe. But what I'm going to say because I, I probably not a good idea to say it all at once and too quickly. <laughs> but to take it to take it in pieces, first, we want to say this isn't about salvation exactly. It's not about eternal destiny. The choice of Jacob does not mean that Esau is condemned to eternal condemnation. Like this is a different kind of election. We're, we're talking about elected for a purpose, what Paul says, the purpose of God's election. 
And the purpose of his election, we found out in Abraham. Abraham was chosen to be a light to the Gentiles, right? So that all nations on earth might be blessed through him. So we're not, we want to be careful when we're talking about this, Jacob and Esau, that we're not talking about the, the saved and the damned. We're talking about roles to play on, on earth. Mm -hmm. And Abraham was chosen over his brother, you know, Nahor, not because Nahor is going to go to hell and Abraham is going to go to heaven, but because Abraham is being chosen to bless all nations, which I would assume also would include his brother. Mm -hmm. So the, the election of God is not about salvation at this, in this, at this particular instance. That's not what we want to talk about. It is about salvation because it's about the salvation of the world, but it's not about the salvation or condemnation of these individuals. So that's the first thing. Um, I don't know. Do you want to respond to that before I go on? Yeah, I tend to agree. I think that's what I was what I was trying to trying to say is there's like there's it's, there has to be some distinctiveness in order in order to show that 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 uh, God has God has called them out to to, uh, to to actually do something. Yeah. Um. So so I, I mean in that sense, yeah, I agree. You know, it's not it's not we're not talking eternal judgment. It's not the same. I right, agree. right. When it says Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. He's not talking about condemnation. Again, the, 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 the Hebrew words love and hate, in that case, ahav and um, shene or sane. Some Hebrew scholar will tell me if that's a sin or a sheen. I just can't remember off the top of my head. They look the same, the dots in a different place. I think it's sane. But anyway, hate. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not an emotional term. I mean, it's not that they're, it's emotionless either. It's not a Vulcan term either. But, but mm -hmm. it's not a heavily emotional term. It doesn't mean loathe. Hate doesn't mean loathe. It means to not choose. So, so um, you might say, today, you offer me vanilla ice cream or chocolate. Which do I want? Well, if I choose vanilla, then on that day, vanilla I loved, chocolate I hated. That's Hebrew. It's, it, you either choose for or choose against. And so what he means by Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, is Jacob I cho chose, Esau I didn't. But what's clear enough in the scriptures is that Jacob was chosen to save Esau too. There are books in the Bible about the Edomites. And if the Edomites had been willing to join Israel, they would be saved. The only way they're condemned if, is if they remain Edomites. But if they become part of Israel, especially once Jesus comes by faith in Jesus, they will be saved. So it's not about salvation there. It's about choice. So what we, what we also want to recognize when we look at this election language we are told in our culture, probably because we live in America, one of the wealthiest countries on earth, and we live at a time where there is so much prosperity in America that even the poorest people in America would be rich in almost any other place on earth. Um, because of that, we are kind of raised with the idea that all of us deserve to be used by God. All of us deserve a blessing. And all of us will equally partake in the riches of the kingdom. I think that is easy to sell in America because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. That's not to say everybody gets it. There's plenty of poverty in the United States. But poverty here can pale in comparison to the kind of poverty you see in some places in the world. Uh, but there's still poverty and people suffer. And I certainly grew up in a, in a very uh, poor family when I was young. Things changed when I got older and my father uh, got his education and, and his own business and some other things. But when I was young, we were very tightly strapped. But America allows for that kind of lifting yourself up in certain circumstances. And because of that, I think we have this idea, everybody has a right. So you kind of, we were sold a Christianity that says God has a plan for all of our lives. Every one of us is an absolutely essential piece of God's plan. And, and you are essential to what God is doing. And every one of us is essential. And you just have to find out. We're almost told like now, everybody's Abraham. Everybody's Jacob. There are no more Esau's. There are no more Isaac's. There are no more people who aren't chosen, right? But that is probably a bit of ego stroking that we could do away with. Most of us in the general experience of our life are not chosen like Abraham or Jacob are. We are all offered salvation, but some people are given, like prophets and apostles, calls that they have to follow. Now, we often think of that as honoring, and we can become jealous. If we happen to be Cain, we're jealous of Abel. If we happen to be Esau, we're jealous of Jacob. We want to be the one winning all the awards on television, famous, you know, known, mm -hmm. influential. Like, we all want to be that. 
the scriptures are very clear that God doesn't choose everyone for those roles. But you know, it's a great gift to not be chosen. Look at the life Jacob will have. Esau's was better. I mean, Esau gets to pursue his own aims. He gets wealthy himself. He becomes successful. He's not in the conflict with Laban. He's not, I mean, Jacob suffers. Yeah. And what you find out is that the chosen are fully revealed in Jesus. The election of Jacob, the way God loves Jacob, is expressed on the cross. He chooses a group of people to be sacrificed for the rest. Now, we're jealous of them because God speaks to them, because they seem to have a really close relationship, because they are given laws and rules and promises that we're not given. So we become very jealous of these people, but the truth is they're chosen to die. They're chosen to sacrifice themselves for the rest. Jacob is loved by God to suffer for everybody else. That's the suffering servant of Isaiah, and that is fulfilled in Jesus. And it's lived out by the apostles and the prophets. So some of it, we're envious of people who have these gifts. But we probably shouldn't be because those gifts are, are not just for them. It's for the world. And we get to live a, a, a life without the sacrifice that some of them have to endure. So this idea that all of us are chosen in the same way, we probably should evacuate. In fact, I would say, don't wish to be chosen. Um, you know, I mean, we all want to be used, but God uses his people in ways that often cost them a great deal. You can just read the stories of Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Paul, Peter, uh, Jesus, <laughs> uh, Jacob, um, Joseph. I mean, yes, he gets to rule Egypt, but wow, is that a road to get there? <laughs> and it ain't a good one, you know? So, but the point is God's election is for salvation. It's for the salvation of the world, not for the salvation of the individual who's chosen. And it often comes at a very high cost, a cost of a great deal of sacrifice, but that choosing is for everybody else. And so I wish we would raise our kids with the idea that it's okay to be normal. It's okay to be nobody. It's okay to be anonymous. In fact, that's the experience of most people on earth. Thank the Lord we're not all that because we would have lost the knowledge of God. But it's perfectly fine to be someone who just did your job, kept your head down, enjoyed your life, were content, received the blessings that God gives to all creatures on earth, and put your faith in Jesus and make you, you didn't stand out. That's a great blessing. And that's almost everybody. And that's Esau. And that's Ishmael. And that is, um, you know, countless people. It's a majority of people in the scriptures are those people. But for some reason, we're always envious of the ones that God chooses, and we probably shouldn't be. Yeah, maybe it's one of those uh, the star, star, like Hollywood star mentality. Nobody wants to be the, 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 the kid that's getting picked on. Yeah, I, I tell my kids all the time, and I heard this from Hollywood starlets and, and, and actors, they, they'll say that anonymity is something they never appreciated till they lost it. The ability to sit down in a restaurant, nobody knows who you are. Like, we all think we want to be famous, but there is a dark side to fame if you pursue it in a human way. And there's a dark side to being chosen by God as Jacob was, because God chooses his people to sacrifice themselves. This is why... I, we often say to young people who say they have a call to ministry, I was told this, were you told this, Minister Joe? If you can do anything else without obeying God, you should. Without disobeying God, you should. Yeah. Because it's not, it's, it's, it's simply not as glorious as people think. Yeah, awful spotlighting, and sometimes even your family's at risk. There's, there's a, lot, a lot to it. Um, Anybody who gets to be in the public eye will be scrutinized by a ton of people. I was watching this uh, psychologist who said human beings are, he was talking about social media, and he was saying human beings are built to handle um, about five to 10 to 15 people having an opinion about them. Mm -hmm. Like you can handle about five to 10 to 15 people having an opinion about you, but we are not built for a thousand people to have opinion about us. Like we can't handle that. 
Right. And on Facebook, you can literally have thousands and thousands of people voicing their opinion about you, millions of people, and nobody is built for that. You and I were not built to have the opinions of a million people matter. Like it drives people out of their minds, drives them crazy. And the same thing is true for pastors, right? I mean, you, we have to, depending on the size of our church, we have to, all these people have an opinion about us, a moral opinion, whether we're good people or bad people. They don't even know us. They're not even in our houses. They don't see how we interact with anybody, but they have an opinion about us that's very, very difficult. And think about being a patriarch. Think about being Jacob, who's carrying the future of the world on his shoulders. You know, that's what he's been told from the time he was little. That's what the blessing he gets from Isaac is. All the earth's going to be blessed through you. The promises to Abraham, you having children will change the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, you might think, oh, what an honor, but it's not an honor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it just puts you in the crosshairs of everybody. It makes you able. And the chosen are always able. They're envied, they're criticized, they're ridiculed, they're attacked, and Jesus lives out their life fully. They kill him. That, that's, do you want that? I mean, if God chooses you, it's an honor, like Paul said, but you shouldn't covet it. It's way better to be anonymous. It's way better to be someone who receives the blessings of those who are chosen without the cost. Yeah. Now, there's a cost to all discipleship. Yeah. Some are asked to pay a much higher cost. I, yeah. think of, I think of the martyrs and the apostles. I mean, the cost that they were called, they were chosen. Mm -hmm. you know i i don't know that we should covet that we should be grateful for it and if god calls you to it he'll see you through it but we should be careful that we don't desire it yeah it seems it seems like in modern days that, that people are more interested in the benefits the actual uh cost cost or the relationship or the, or the 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 actual calling if you more interested in the benefits, it seems. Yeah, and if you get too caught up, just... some people who do have these gifts and they and they are uniquely suited to be successful in their time, or they're uniquely called to carry a burden others aren't called. They can get full of themselves, right? Some the old saying is that people come to believe their own press, and um, that's a bad person. You never want the chosen to get full of themselves. And God usually finds ways of humbling his chosen ones, which is why they suffer so much. Um, but um, yes, you don't want them to get full of themselves. You want them to be humble and God will make sure that it's hard to get full of yourself. If you're really called by God, he'll humble you a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, the greater honor sometimes is just being the support structure. I've, I've always said, you know, I would have rather have been a run of the mill Levite than, than being Aaron. And I'd rather be cleaning the temple than going into the Holy of Holies to find out if God's mad at the people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. and sometimes that's the contentment the New Testament talks about, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. In some ways, there's no more blessed life than a godly person living a godly life with faith in Jesus who's content with what you have. You, you might have the, the greatest blessing anyone's ever been given. You know, it, there's no reason. So I guess we get into all that to simply say God does choose some people to move history forward in the way he wants. And he does not choose everyone in that way. But that's not to say he doesn't want to see all of us saved. Yeah. Or that he's not. I mean, in, very, in doing that, he's being faithful to all of us. And so there's a love for all of us that's shown in his loving some people specially. And I think we just have to accept that. Well, the church certainly makes that distinction with, with, with uh, being called the preachers. There, there's at least our church, uh, I mean, denomination one, doesn't doesn't make it exactly easy for somebody just to do the ministry without uh, quite a bit of scrutiny, scrutiny and, and educational benefits uh, or educational aspects as too. So. Well, that that's not not as easy as some other places, but but uh, the, the reality I, I look to, choose to look at that as as a as a means to really to really out to really think that think it through to experience some things that that help help to reveal whether or not it was uh, a shouldn't say a fad but a, a 
something that that, that wasn't real well founded. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, some and we probably should say this, Minister Joe, at least I want to say it. Just becoming a pastor doesn't mean that you're called in the way that Jacob was or that I am. Like there's a difference between fulfilling a role that the church needs filled and being willing to fill that role and making the sacrifices necessary to do it well. There's a difference between that and being called in the way Jacob was. So we, we also want to distinguish between those things. My insistence, though, is that you have to feel the Lord's with you when you make a choice to take some of these more significant roles in terms of responsibility because they come at great cost. Um, and so you have to take that very seriously and you want to know the Lord is with you. You certainly don't want to be dis... But I would not want to say, and maybe I was making it sound this way, that the call to pastor is identical to Jacob's call. Jacob's call is very different. Um, you know, the call to pastor is a call to a... a, a position of service in the church but the call of jacob is a it's a prophetic call and they're not always the same all path all pastors who preach are responsible to be prophets in the sense that they're responsible to read the word of god and to proclaim it for our time so we all have a prophetic office but not all are prophets and so i, I don't want to conflate those two calls but I do want to say there's an, anal there's an analogy. Those who serve with greater responsibility in the kingdom tend to embrace greater humility if they do it right. Because in the kingdom of God, it's not the chosen who, who stand atop. The chosen, like Jesus says, you, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you must be the servant of all. We just have to know what our area of service is. But calling like Jacob's, is is even more than that it's the calling of ezekiel and jeremiah and paul and peter and i'm sure countless others since the close of the new testament that god has called to keep history moving forward and that's a different call and and you should not pursue it because it, it'll never be good though it's necessary and so i'm just trying to bring some reasonableness to this feeling that maybe God is playing favorites. I would say be careful about that because when God chooses one person to move history forward like he does Jacob, he's doing that for the sake of everyone. But for the sake of Esau, he has to hate Esau. And I think that's the mystery of the gospel. That for the sake of the Gentiles, God chose Israel. That for the sake of the nations, he selected a unique group of people. Yeah, I think people focus more on the distinction than realizing, you know, the, the reality the, or the purpose. That's what I was getting at with, with the, the benefits and uh, following rather than actually the reason why. Uh, I mean, you're a father. Have you ever had a task that you knew only one of your children could help with? It wasn't a task that would be best done by a committee? Like if you had four or five people helping you, it would not be helpful. It would be counterproductive. So you could just choose one. And did you ever choose that one, not because they had a particular set of skills, but because of another reason? Oh yeah. One that easier to work with. <laughs> maybe easier to work with. Maybe someone you hadn't, maybe one of your kids you hadn't really had a chance to talk with. And so you thought this would be a good opportunity to chat. God doesn't always choose people because they have a particular set of skills. Sometimes the choice has something that, something else entirely and that's what i think paul is getting at in romans 9 just because a person's chosen by god doesn't even mean that he thought they were best suited to that task might have been another reason entirely you know and, and if you're a parent you know what that's like yeah definitely no no i know i'd have a better success rate if i if i asked my daughters to do laundry than my son right but maybe although, there's a reason you might ask your son. Yeah, although he's gotten a lot better at it being a college. So, <laughs> you gotta do your, well, you got to wash your own clothes. It's a different story, isn't it? It is. It's an entirely different story. So, uh, so now I think that's probably as far as we should go. I mean, we could go down that rabbit trail a lot deeper. Um, but, oh, it's not a rabbit trail. It's, it's clearly there in the text and part of the scriptures. But I think we've said enough. Maybe some of our people can push that a little bit further. 
Yeah. But but do you have any closing comments, Minister Joe, as we wrap up this part of, of Genesis? I mean, we're going to get back to these same themes over and over again. I mean, the very next scene is when Esau sells his birthright, and there's another rivalry. Yeah, I think I think probably in, in, in toward the end here, I'd really want really want to make it say, make it clear that that it's we we got to be careful not to take such things so so personal. It's so hard not to though when it, when we talk about about God, God actually calling or, or this idea of uh, of election. Oftentimes, people think that it's I'm I'm the, I'm the one I'm the candidate and I support this message. You know, kind of yeah. kind of uh, this idea that, that it's that's it's so, so personal, uh, and not to realize that, that God God does have a purpose for us, um, but the plan doesn't seem like it's, it's always as clear to us as it is as it is to Him. Yeah, you know, and so I I, I think that that uh, if we're you know. When we're, the extreme, like we were talking about before, about salvation, is that it, I, th- I think it's pretty literal in my, in my mind that, it, that it, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but but want to know Him. If, if that's the if that's the point, and I misquoted it. That, that's the thing. But I I think that the, the desire for that I want to, what would like us to really end, end with here is that don't don't just Take it so personal, thinking that because you had some hardship in life, that God doesn't like you, right. doesn't want you, um, or or even if you made some bad decisions, because we certainly see some here in the passage, or or if you think that maybe you're treating your kids the wrong way, maybe you need to review that. Think about that. I am the family life pastor or minister, so I I do care about you and your family and how you relate to your kids and. Yeah. Um, but strong favoritism within the family, I know that can be a problem too. So. Okay. But every parent is put in a situation where they have to choose one to do something and they can't choose them all. Like who's going to be the executor of the will? Who's going to have the the right to make end of life decisions? Sometimes that has to be designated as one person. So every family is, is in a situation where they have to choose um, who this is going to be. And it, it, that can be a very difficult choice, though. In some families, some of the kids are glad they weren't the one chosen. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And and sometimes parents choose other people in order in order to help with those decisions because they know their kids can't handle it. Um, yeah. I'm an executor for for somebody else's estate too, um, because I'm pretty sure that they, their kids may may have a hard time dealing with it. Right. School. Yeah, so so you, you just have to be careful with this election thing. And I like what you said. Don't take it personally. Showing favoritism to children. Remember, God doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't choose Jacob because he's better than Esau because he likes him more. That's what Isaac and Rebekah were doing. Isaac had a favorite. Rebekah had a favorite. But Paul says God didn't choose Jacob because Jacob was his favorite. He simply chose him. Yeah. And you can choose your kids to do tasks without playing favorites. Right? Right. So that's an important thing to remember. And always remember, you know, I think we've been too shaped, Minister Joe, by Disney. (laughs) You know, and and Disney was shaped by stories that come from Western Europe. So it's probably just a cultural thing. But I'm thinking of like the movie Beauty and the Beast, where Belle is singing, there's got to be more than this provincial life. You know, where we just want more than what, presents itself we want to be exceptional we want to be the princess or the or the the star athlete or the successful business person we just want more than what our parents had and you know scripturally that's not necessarily a very admirable character trait like the desire for an honorable simple life in which we can feed our children, pay our bills, love our spouse, raise our kids with integrity and work hard at a job where we can feel good about the effort we put in and our final product. That can be the greatest blessing of all. And yet many of us never get that life because we're always looking for the brass ring. Now it's true if you're not looking for the brass ring, you probably won't get it, Mm -hmm. but maybe it's not worth getting. Right. You know, 
don't get caught up in this idea that we have to all be special. And because of that, God favored Jacob and, and poor Esau got second fiddle. Esau had a great life not being chosen. And there's no guarantee he won't be in glory. We don't know anything about his faith in the God of Abraham. That story's not told to us. The fact that Jacob was chosen doesn't mean Esau is necessarily condemned. He'll be condemned based on his faith in the, in the, he's not based, he's not condemned based on his election. He's condemned based on his faith in the God of Abraham. And we don't know what kind of faith Esau had in the God of Abraham. We certainly see later when he meets his brother that he's more forgiving than you might expect him to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, so, Jacob, Jacob expects, expects something different. He does. Oh, Jacob expects Esau to be the same Esau he left. Yeah. The Esau that was planning to kill him. Yeah. But Esau's changed. So again, mm -hmm. Esau's fate is not based on whether he was chosen from the time he was born. His fate is based on his faith in the God of Abraham. But he was also not chosen. You can be saved and not be chosen. Right. We're saved by faith. That's right. Well, thank you, Minister Joe. This was a tough one. But we're just beginning to get into the heavy theology of Genesis. There we go. I know now that Abraham's gone, the whole place is going to unravel. <laughs> like, like one of those tops. You spin it, spin it, and it click, 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 click. Yeah. 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 It's like Abraham's the deep breath before the plunge, as Gandalf says in Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. yeah. shall not pass <laughs> <laughs> well thank you everybody for joining us we'll, we'll, next time we are going to really get into the sibling rivalry mm -hmm. yep alright we'll see you next time yep thank you very much